oftentimes we're going I'm going to find in uh, either a videotape review or police and or a police officer's report review that the officer just failed to give the adequate instructions to the um, to the subject who was being investigated and when I say adequate instructions there are prescribed standardized instructions um, for standardized field sobriety tests so if those standardized instructions aren't given, then the standardization aspect of the field sobriety test is destroyed, essentially. Those tests are supposedly um, scientifically studied. And they're, when I say supposedly, they were studied um, over a couple decades by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in order to determine whether or not, um, well, whether or not field sobriety tests do have a certain degree of reliability. Through those studies, they found that essentially the, the three that I mentioned before, the one like stand, wall concern, and horizontal gaze nystagmus, when administered all together, do uh, give a high degree of reliability for a police officer to determine whether or not somebody's intoxicated. So the tests themselves are not utilized to determine intoxication. Good. They're simply to, to give an officer a tool to arrest. So according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, if the tests are actually administered in the standardized fashion, then they should have a certain degree of scientific reliability. However, when they're not, then the degree of reliability is unknown or of no merit at all. So um, once I find those factors out through my review, then I can determine, frankly, if the field sobriety tests really have any validity whatsoever. Um, my next question would be, uh, so what kinds of challenges can be made concerning the scientific testing, you know, such as breath and blood tests? Well, with uh, breath testing, once I, I look into uh, my client's uh, medical background, medical history, there may be issues um, which could have caused, as I said, an artificial inflation in the, the breath testing result. So if there was a certain physiological physiological condition that may have caused a, uh, what is called mouth alcohol to occur during the breath testing process, okay. uh, then that's going to affect the final result. If the, uh, for instance, with blood testing, there are a number of uh, issues concerning the, the uh, collection of the blood specimen, transportation of the blood specimen, storage of that blood specimen, uh, there's also going to, uh, should be at least, uh, very detailed documentation concerning the, what is called chain of custody. So who, who actually uh, possessed that blood specimen and where they stored it, what was the, uh, the, the temperature of the storage unit in which it was placed, how long was it stored there, where was it taken from that point, um, how long was it out of uh, refrigeration storage, and then once it gets to the, the lab itself, there are a number of issues that I'm going to be looking into regarding discovery concerning um, what are called chromatograms, which are routinely provided um, during, uh, after blood testing. And that documentation, in addition to a, a number of other documents that I asked for, would be examined not only by, not only would I examine them, but I would potentially have a, a pharmacologist or forensic toxicologist take a look at those items to determine if there are any problems with the actual blood testing that occurred. Okay. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty detailed here in that, your investigation. Um, another question I had is, you know, what, it's probably obviously answered, but what sets you apart from other DWI attorneys who handle, you know, these kind of cases? Well, as uh, I, I think I tried to impart upon upon you in the beginning of this interview is that I do take a, a great deal of time to learn as much about my client as possible. Um, what I what I find to be the most successful method of, of defending a client and attacking the prosecution's case is to not just bring bring a client in and have that person's uh, name on a ledger and basically look at the person as that. Uh, each client I, I treat as a, as a human being. I, each client I, I know has a lot at stake. Um, 
I, I understand um, their very precarious position because of this charge. And for those reasons, I want to make sure that I find out as much about that person as possible. So not only is there a, an adequate comfort level between my client and myself, but obviously I want to be able to create as many different defenses as possible. Um, as well, the, my philosophy is once I, I, I start a case, I certainly don't pawn that, that case off to a, a different associate in, in the firm or somebody else to handle that matter. I'm taking the case from beginning to end. Um, there are various methods of practice in some, some law firms. They, they, they have a client uh, that comes in on an intake. You see one attorney who's going to be handling the intake interview. And then uh, once the client is about to go to court, gets a call from a different attorney saying, hey, listen, I reviewed your, your case and I'm going to be in court with you tomorrow. Well, that's going to create a, a lot of confusion, a lot of um, anxiety. And my job, not only uh, my primary job is obviously to get rid of the DWI, but secondarily, I want to make this as comfortable a process as possible. I want to make sure that each client understands the process and is educated about the process. Because, frankly, when I think anybody goes through a very difficult situation like this, they want to know as much as possible. And it's not like the old days where you kind of say, all right, I'm going to leave it in your hands and you take care of it for me. These days, people really are interested in finding out as much information as possible about the process. And fortunately, um, through the internet, there's a lot of uh, available information to, to people who, who want to get it. They're so motivated. But um, with my practice, it's not only getting to know the client as best as possible, which I find is, is the greatest way to, uh, to get success in these cases, but the other factor that I, I really um, put a lot of weight into in, in making sure that the way I practice law is a little different than other attorneys is that, I, is that I'm constantly educating myself, not only concerning uh, the, the new case law that may come out um, with DWI defense, but I'm also talking about the new uh, scientific studies that are, being, uh, that are being published every day and getting the scientific studies, reading them in regard to breath testing or blood testing or urine testing. Um, and that's not only for alcohol, but for drugs as well, because when we're talking about DWI defense, yes, alcohol is a, essentially, uh, alcohol intoxication defense is a whole different category from uh, drug intoxication defense because these are two different realms, two different methods of testing for the most part, um, and you really have to be aware of not only the, the law behind DWI defense, but the science behind it. And without educating yourself in uh, the, the myriad areas of science that are involved with DWI testing, frankly, you're not doing your client this, you're not giving your client the service that he or she is owed. Okay. Well, yeah, you've taken a lot of time and care to answer the questions, and you know, right now I don't have any more questions for you. And I, you know, I really appreciate your time and your attention in this, in this interview. So, thanks again, Mr. Weckerman, and uh, that ends the interview. Thank you. Okay, thank you.